here. Well, thank you so much for that very warm introduction. And let me say right at the beginning how pleased I am to be back here and how wonderful it is to see these faces that I've seen here before and when some of you came and we had a great time together in Cambridge. And I also want to say that I come with humility to share, not to teach or to say we are the greatest, which we are not, but um, we've been around, some, I've been around in this world now for quite a few years and uh, we've learned a lot of things and I'm learning every day, even this morning I learned, I saw a wonderful new project launched here uh, and we might talk about that after we have the, the formal talks here. But uh, I was asked to come and talk to you today and I am so honoured to be your first International Research Fellow. It's great. It's a wonderful honour for me. Uh, lessons in the development of entrepreneurial ecosystems and I made a special talk to share my thoughts on this with you this evening and we will refer quite a lot to Lati when we come towards the latter part of what I have to say. And I'm here in the spirit of open innovation and knowledge sharing. Those elements have been at the heart of what we have achieved in Cambridge and elsewhere. So, um, this is a nice picture to start with, isn't it? Because my first message is that really it is the people factors and the mindset beyond the local mindset that really make the difference when we ask ourselves the question, what makes an entrepreneurial ecosystem? It is the world's great family of which we are all part. It is a world of opportunity to which we can reach out. And if our attitude and mindset is right, the technology will come along and we will make great progress. And my message to all of my students, I have a lot of students from China. We also have the privilege each year now of a venture camp where 50 students from universities here in Finland come to Cambridge and we come and work with them here. My message is let's make the world a world without borders in our mind. Not talking politics here. Politicians don't do those things, unfortunately, although they may try. We can, in our mindset, have a world without borders and here we are practicing education without borders. We have Jan Storgard in Cambridge now, captive. We've got him for a while. So we have a great Finnish presence with us in Cambridge. And it all leads to business without borders. So the Cambridge phenomenon, uh, just want to touch on these subjects. Don't worry too much about the detail. And we've started with people. So people make the difference. And understanding local and regional strengths and building on them is my first message. Don't try and recreate something that doesn't really have a home here. And we talked a lot about that today. What are your local strengths wherever you are? Areas for development, of course we have gaps. Learning from practical ways other people are doing it. The commercialization of knowledge and research to me is a very, very important subject. Connecting the generations, mentoring, the oldies helping the next generation. These are things I just want to touch on. You will hear messages throughout about this. And networks, in my view, are not ecosystems. If we connect up the networks, we have something much more powerful than just a network. And my sense about Cambridge, and I've been there for 50 years, is that what has emerged is a community of enterprise, common purpose, and social inclusion. And that's what I mean when I refer to the ecosystem. And I'll say a little bit about finance. One of my great interests at the moment is alternative finance and internet finance, which is moving at a great pace. But I haven't got time to talk about the detail of it tonight. We can talk about it afterwards. And one thing I take away from me here, I've been coming here now for 10 years. Learning by developing is something that you in Finland have developed as a pedagogy and a way of working that we have shamelessly stolen from you at the Centre for Entrepreneurial Learning. And I learned all about it here. And just one other reminder, innovation takes time 
and patient. So it took Edison 30 years to develop the electric light bulb. The first model of a tablet was shown publicly in 1968, 42 years to develop the iPad. So it takes time. We have to be patient. So let's think about around the world. I stole this slide from a slideshow on Skolkovo in Moscow, which is not yet one of the great successful clusters, but I just wanted to remind us that when we look around the world, there are many clusters of creativity. And Mr. Putin said to uh, his team there, OK, guys, you've got three years to build me Silicon Valley in Moscow. You can have all the money you want. No problem. Not so easy to do, though, is it? They came to see us and said, do you think we can do it? We had to be disappointing and say, well, it might be difficult in three years. Put a naught on the end and maybe you'll do it. Money is not the answer. But when we look around the world, these are just some of the clusters of creativity, the ecosystems that have grown up over the last relatively short number of years. You've got them in Finland, certainly in, in Espoo, Helsinki. You see Denmark, Sweden, London. Uh, we just formed Med City in London, connecting Cambridge, Oxford and London up. There's a great one in Maastricht called Camelot. There's Waterloo in Canada, and there are numbers of them in China. And a major newcomer is in Ecuador, where they plan to build an amazing ecosystem if they can do it. We don't know whether they will succeed yet. So, we can have a look at just a one or two of them in more detail. And when you talk about entrepreneurial ecosystems, most people immediately say Silicon Valley. I actually have a view that the East Coast of America is at least as important, where MIT have a great model for entrepreneurial ecosystems. But there are stunning examples, and I wanted just to show two other images that you might not normally think of in terms of entrepreneurial ecosystems. This is Berlin at the end of the dreadful Second World War. And innovation and the human spirit from that terrible debris has created this. This is Science City in the same place in 2010. It's an amazing transformation. Human spirit, energy, enterprise, yeah, technology, but more than that. And there's another wonderful picture. I go a lot to China. And in 27 years, look at the top picture of Pudong Island with nothing there. And now look at the bottom one and see what has been created in such a short space of time. Entrepreneurship and innovation in action. So uh, that's just a bit of background. And these are the characteristics that one of my friends in Silicon Valley, um, Jim Gibbons, <coughs> gave me when I said, what are the characteristics that make Silicon Valley sustainable? And he gave us a list of things. Now, if you think of those centers, and if you think of your own activity, those elements, you can read quickly through them, are present where we find entrepreneurial ecosystems. But we also find the mentality of international thinking. And we do find science and technology, uh, just a, a reference to that. We find technology platforms that are pervasive, biotech, information technology, nanotech, working together, where in open innovation enables the transfer of knowledge that people would not otherwise transfer. And where these circles join up, there's dramatically enhanced opportunity for innovation. And I've seen it today in some of the discussions we've had. I brought this back from Science City in um, Berlin. It's a very good example of the innovation campus, where we put education, R&D, and applications. This is something you're doing here. You're practicing this, where symbiosis and synergy can thrive. So, within all this, I'm not going to talk to this subject because Lenny is going to talk to it, but I do like this slide which tells me that the modern university is very different than the one that I found in Cambridge when I went there in 1967, mm -hmm. where we taught and we did research, and anyone that mentioned exploitation was almost put in jail. Things have changed a very great deal. And the 21st century university is so much about students and alumni and faculty working together. And the government, of course, is very interested in seeing this happen. Cambridge is an ancient university. 
with a lot of modern things going on. Uh, you are a modern university here embracing 21st century concepts. Just a little bit more context, uh, then I will get quickly to the Cambridge phenomenon. Now, I was talking to one of your dear people today about this man. He was a goldsmith and silversmith, and his name was Gutenberg, Johannes Gutenberg. And 500 years later, we had Tim Berners-Lee, and I show their pictures because they are heroes of communication. They changed the world. And one of the contexts of entrepreneurial ecosystems is all about communication and the transfer of knowledge. And Gutenberg, uh, with the moving type printing press, uh, way back in 1458, brought about a revolution, and then Tim Berners-Lee started an even bigger revolution. We don't know where this one will end. I mean, it's amazing where we're going with the internet. We don't know. So against that background, what are the big people differences when I now come to tell you quickly about the Cambridge phenomenon? Now, that's Albert Einstein, as you will know. And he said, one of the biggest differences, if you want to make progress, is imagination. And he said that imagination is more important than knowledge because it encircles the world. And another one of my heroes, if you want me to give you a definition of what is an entrepreneur, I'm showing you a picture of George Bernard Shaw. Not a scientist, not a technologist. And my story about George Bernard Shaw is that one day he was in his London house with a young man who was asking him many, many boring questions. And he said, shut up. And he said these words. He said, you look at things and ask why. But I dream of things that never were and ask why not. You cannot name for me one great change maker who walked on this earth through history who was not a why not person. They were all why not people. They were all subject to great hurdles. They were not yes but, yes but people. They were why not people. They changed the world. And in our own way, we can change the world. So here is a very tranquil part of England and in the middle of it, the evolution of an entrepreneurial ecosystem. And I won't uh, bore you with too much detail here, but what we've seen happen is a complete change in culture a new ABC, where academia, business and the community work together in a way they never did when I went there. When I went there, there were farmers, academics, bicycles and students. Not much business, one big company. It's all changed. The university, of course, is more than 800 years old. This is a, a picture when it was celebrating that. But it is ancient and modern at the same time. And if we look at Cambridge and its colleges, yes, there's always been wonderful science. This Trinity College, um, 1347, Newton was there. The word scientist was invented by one of the masters of Trinity, William Hewell, before uh, 1837 when he used the term for the first time. Scientists were referred to as natural philosophers, and in a way they still are. So it was an academic ecosystem when I went there, but it was not an entrepreneurial ecosystem. Very, very great discovery, wonderful science. And here are some of the 90 Nobel Prize winners. Um, second row, fourth from right, and then third row, second from left, is the man who, amongst very, very few, won two of them. And uh, Sir Fred Sanger, after whom we name our, um, our uh, genome center. So there's always been great science, ideas that change the world. And there are some of the other names, Crick, Watson, uh, Newton. But my point is that although those ideas changed the world, they didn't actually get exploited very well in Cambridge. R&D <coughs> is not innovation. Research and development on its own does not create wealth or good things for mankind. It needs something more. And innovation and the entrepreneurial spirit is really what makes the big difference. So there we are, the university and its colleges. That's the Senate House. I was at um, graduation of um, a really wonderful lady from Finland, the first student from a, a University of Applied Sciences who did a PhD, Krista Karenin, was um, graduated three weeks ago uh, on her knees, all in Latin, very solemn. Um, quite an interesting experience. So we have also nine other universities in the region, including Anglia Ruskin, which is a very much bigger university 
we have 31 colleges and lots of students. And for those that haven't been there, just a reminder that Cambridge University is not only embracing the past, but it's embracing the present and the future. This is the Muller Centre. And we had £10 million from a Nordic gentleman, Mr. A.P. Muller of the Muller Mess McKinsey Company, loved Winston Churchill, our wartime Prime Minister, so much that he gave us 10 million and we have the wonderful Muller Centre. He only died quite recently, but I think he must have been over 100 years old. I met him when he was in his 90s. So, it wasn't always like that. 60 years ago, the region was deprived and in decline. Uh, it was absolutely declining. These are the traditional industries. Agriculture is still there, but fishing has died away almost entirely. Leather goods have gone to another part of England. This was the first great center of the wool trade. But when the Industrial Revolution brought mechanized equipment, which worked in the damp climate, it all moved up towards Manchester, um, around the northwest. And all of that largely has gone away and been replaced with something very, very different, because we are now one of the fastest growing regions in Europe. It has been a transformation. Uh, the population of the Greater Cambridge region, which is on the map there, is about 50,000, and we have about 360,000 jobs. The, 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 uh, the 60,000 jobs are the high-tech jobs that we refer to. So, the origins of the Cambridge cluster. This is some part of the story that is not well known. In 1950-something, uh, IBM came to Cambridge and said, we want to put our R&D centre in Cambridge. The university said, get out of here. We don't want that kind of stuff here. We're a great university. We don't want American computer companies. They went to Germany. In 1960, some really courageous young men formed a company called Cambridge Consultants. And they said to the university, we formed this company in order to exploit the R&D of the university. The university said, get on your bikes and ride away. <laughs> this is sacrilege. We teach, we do research. They didn't go away. They formed a company which became a very, very famous contract research company worldwide. And from it was spawned a family. This is a family of companies. PA Technology, all of these companies are rich engineering and R&D companies. They are commercial R&D uh, <laughs> providers. And some of you, when you came to Cambridge, visited Cambridge Design Partnership, which is another one of those companies. And it will be great to see one or two thriving here um, in Finland. So there are now large numbers of people involved. Um, the bottom point is the most important one. The first 50 to 70 early stage companies that grew up in Cambridge didn't come directly from the university. They were born and, and nurtured and mentored and incubated by these companies. And the same thing happened in a very important area for Cambridge, industrial inkjet printing. Cambridge Consultants was responsible for the generation of about 70% of the world's industrial inkjet printing industry which is now worth very many billions, has em employs many, many people around the world. And uh, certainly, that the companies that were born from Cambridge consultants dominate the world. So this is a part of the Cambridge phenomenon story that isn't often enough told. I don't know why. But this was the university in the background. Once it all got going, of course, the university came to the foreground. And if you talk to the vice chancellor today, he probably would say, we did all that. But they didn't. We have to be honest about it. So when we look at, um, thinking back to my circular slide with the characteristics of high-tech regions, here's what we have in Cambridge. It's a similar list. By the way, um, your husband is on that campus today, Lena, yes, with one of my companies, yes. yeah, with, with uh, Eagle Genomics in Bioinformatics. Yes. That building is an old country mansion. It's surrounded by 45 million pounds worth of modern buildings. It's uh, 50 companies on the Baber and Bioscience campus. So, um, that's what's been going on in Cambridge, and I say that the real reason behind it all wasn't technology, but was mindset. Open innovation, brain circulation, people willing to share, breaking down the barriers had made a huge difference. And, and Jan and, and Lena, they sit there, uh, they walk around a bit too, but they sit in Cambridge <laughs> and they see all this stuff 
going on where people are so willing to share and communicate. And over time, uh, as you see, it was quite a narrow base. Uh, these are the high-tech jobs. And I made this slide in 2004 when we did a report for the minister, Lord Sainsbury. And we predicted the future, and it has come true, not because we were clever, but the future is today. Those are the, the very diverse range of technologies that we have in Cambridge. So over time, what we saw happening, and this is only part of the picture, a number of companies, a number of institutions, a number of support services were brought into life, and this was the evolution of the Cambridge cluster, which was very exciting. And right at the heart of it were people again. From the university, this was a piece of research done by uh, one of our bright young MBAs, uh, UPA at the Judge Business School, and she looked at how entrepreneurs built their social networks. Don't worry a bit about the detail, just look at some of the names that keep recurring. There are pillar names here. And it was the building of real networks, not just online social networks that caused the big change in culture. And what I say to everyone I meet and discuss this subject with, don't overlook the importance of intermingling. And one of the principal factors, we talked about this this morning in Cambridge, was the formation about 15 to 20 years ago of the Cambridge Network. The university and five companies put up a small amount of money each, and there is now the Cambridge Network Limited, www.cambridgenetwork.co.uk. Everyone identifies with it. There's a, there are all kinds of different special services, job shops, special interest groups. And uh, again, one of my recommendations is think about an overarching innovation network if you want to build an ecosystem based on entrepreneurship. Because networking needs enabling. It doesn't just happen on its own. And we won't go into any detail here, but we now have 20 science parks and innovation centres around Cambridge. Uh, and what happened, once it was seen that we were building this cluster, larger companies from overseas wanted to invest and be near the university and all the science, but also be close to the action of the companies. And we have uh, the ideas space now at the House of Forum, as well as all of these investing companies. And a few months ago, Huawei from China bought a Cambridge company called Newell in telecommunications for 25 million. So we now have the world's largest telecommunications uh, infrastructure company in Cambridge with us. And open innovation needs space. There has to be space for serendipity to work. And in this building, which Herman Hauser and his wife have provided again another 8 million, is the idea space where young companies can be for a day a week, a day a month, uh, no structure, they're not allowed to have their own office, they have to sit and work together. So science parks um, in the UK started before anywhere else in Europe and this was 1970 and this is a sad picture for me because <clears throat> since that portrait was done last year, Sir John Bradfield uh, died at the age of 89. He was the bursar the, fi the financial head of Trinity College, he was my neighbour, and to the day he died, he went to the college every day. He fell down dead under the great gate of Trinity on his way to dinner. And that was sad, but as his son said, where would there be a better place for him to leave the world? He was a really, really great guy. And he went to America and he saw Science Park, he came back and founded the first one in Cambridge. And the Science Park now is fully developed and um, is being a great success for Trinity. So with all this happening, people started to compare us with Silicon Valley. And I don't like that too much. I don't like the people who say, you can replicate Silicon Valley, you can replicate. Don't replicate. Look to your own strengths and find out what you can do best. But anyway, that little blue area there, or, or the, inside the blue area, that's the map of Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is very small. And Cambridge has the advantage of being very small. Just quickly now to get towards the end. This is the cover of the annual report of Cambridge Enterprise. We have a company in the university that does the commercialization of research uh, and provides financial support, does all the intellectual property management. About 50 people work in that company now. And it's really been very, very successful. 
and the commercialization of research is extremely important. And um, just a few numbers here, people like numbers, these are the numbers of researchers, the operational income, the number of licenses signed, uh, the consultancy fees. Don't worry about the numbers, you can keep the slides and have a look at them. But Cambridge Enterprise has been very, very successful. And we've always had seed funds, but last year, because the university became fed up with investing at the very early stages, and then the venture capitalists moved in, and as the companies grew big, the university share was diluted away. They've raised a new 50 million fund, so the university itself can now do A and B venture capital rounds, which is very important. So, um, 63 companies are within the portfolio. <coughs> I've been the chairman of a couple of them. So that's been a, remember, this happened over 50 years. This is not a, a five minute thing. So uh, it doesn't happen overnight. And the message here is that when an entrepreneurial ecosystem gets going, you get momentum and you can attract a lot more investment from outside. And just a few summary uh, figures, don't worry about them. We now have 14 one billion dollar companies since the start of the phenomenon in Cambridge. Two of them are 10 billion and one of them is 25 billion. That one is Arm Holdings, which is a very, very interesting company. We also have, of course, the problems of growth, traffic, housing is very expensive, um, all kinds of difficulties. You can't have everything. If you have growth, you will have pain, as well as gain. So, that's the way it is. Now, I'm not going to go through any of these numbers, but what I wanted to do, especially after this morning's discussion, was because we came up this morning with, well, how do we present what we have in LATI? And, and I'll leave all this with you. We have done a lot of work on infographics, so we say, this is the Cambridge cluster, 1,500 jobs, it's gone up to 60,000 from 57 since this slide was made, I can assure you of that. And more information, and then there is um, uh, just a, a way of showing what's happening locally. The university, uh, how many graduates, all the things that are going on in the university, presented as infographics, and then the partnerships that we have presented as infographics. Not just, not, don't want you to look at the detail, I just wanted you to see um, what we've done. Role models are very important. This is Herman Hauser, came from the Tyrol, did a PhD at King's. His subject of research was rust, never left England, might go home for holidays. Found Acorn Computers, which was one of the first European computer companies. Then Venture Capital is worth probably about 150 million now. But he is a great benefactor and a really wonderful role model for the young entrepreneurs. And we've got the book, some of you have seen it, The Cambridge Phenomena, which has now been published in Mandarin. And um, this is my real message about what has happened in Cambridge. It wasn't the government that said do this or do that. It was a bottom-up building of communities, as I said, of common purpose and enterprise and social inclusion. And uh, this is a lovely picture from the one of the recent reports of Cambridge Enterprise showing how joined upness, and you know this and you're working on it, you're doing very well at it, joined up society, joined up system makes a huge difference. And for the future, just a quick flash, these are the things we're working on. Computing, telecoms, materials, very important, nanotechnology, regenerative medicine, uh, Clean tech and green tech, that's where we want to collaborate very much on what you're doing here and energy and stuff like that. But I'm ending. I'm coming to your hub. Let's go local. The foundations of an entrepreneurial ecosystem are here. They are here. You're part of it. And the university, in a way, is at least one of the center points of entrepreneurial ecosystem, without any doubt. These are from your own slides. I'm not going to go through them. I just wanted you to see. I have been studying what's going on here. These are just some of the things. Some of them are out of date because your strategy has changed. But these are some of the great things going on here. High levels of creativity and innovation in your place. A real commitment to contribute to the growth of the EU. You have it. You know you're working on it. It's wonderful. International activities. All the partnerships that are being forged around the world.
So you're really on the way here. And participation in the venture camps that we love to do so much. The vision, absolutely wonderful vision. Uh, remember what Einstein said, imagination is more important than knowledge. You're encouraging imagination. Practice-based innovation, very, very important. NADEC, where I've been and know some of the things going on. I'm sure you've updated all this since I got these slides and I need the new ones. <laughs> but you have the science part, you have clean tech design. And this is work in progress. This is an entre entrepreneurial ecosystem building on strengths. Not on things you think you ought to do, but things you know you've got. You've got great strength in some of these areas, like uh, clean tech. You've got strength in design. And this is one of your slides. I think it's a wonderful slide. Collaboration is everything. Communities of enterprise, common purpose, and social inclusion came back to my mind when I looked at that slide. And the services you've got. Uh, you know this, and I'm not going to dwell on it, but I just wanted to put it on because it's here. Acceleration. I talked about Cambridge. Well, you're accelerating. You've got your accelerator here, and these are the things that it does. And by the way, I do slowish. I show these slides elsewhere. So I'm promoting you. You've got the science part. Uh, let's be real about this, you know. There's a tremendous amount that's going on here. So my end, um, you've talked about lessons and I haven't taken up more than the time you gave me. Have a good, honest audit of strengths and gaps. Build connectivity, an innovation network. Keep everyone informed. Let everyone know what's going on. Then they will be engaged. Entrepreneurial education and support. I see so much happening here. I heard a lot about it this morning. The wonderful programs that are going on here. Strengthen it. Um, one of the jobs that I don't get paid for, but I love doing. I'm an entrepreneur in residence at Cambridge University. I have a card. It says entrepreneur in residence. We have 40 of us entrepreneurs in residence. It's a great thing, entrepreneurs in residence. Grey hairs who really want to help the next generation. Uh, international connections and participate in super networks. And this is my ending because um, I've got a couple of examples here of what I mean by super networks or super networks. And I've been involved in them both. In Leuven, that some of you know very well, the ELAT, the Eindhoven Leuven Arc and Triangle, was founded, I don't know, 15 years ago. I was there, they asked me to go and moderate their discussion about whether they should do it. Because they said, we're Belgians, uh, Dutch and German, and um, we want, an, in, we want a, a referee who is impartial. Will you come and referee the discussion? And they formed it out, and there it is. You know, three cities, one hour away from each other, in three countries. It's great. And more recently than that, we have formed between Leuven, Heidelberg and Cambridge Health Access Europe to exchange information on the latest things going on in that field. So my final thought, um, I love this one. This is Deborah Johnson Ross. We have to care and risk and dream more than other people do if we really want to achieve excellence. So I say we have to set the highest standards possible if we want to build real entrepreneurial ecosystems. And uh, I thank you for listening and I'm hoping we can have a bit of a discussion a bit later. Thank you.